to Bar and Blog, and today I'm here with Zoe Baker, um, <clears throat> libertarian socialist philosopher with a PhD in the history of anarchism, author of the book Means and Ends, the Revolutionary Practice of Anarchism in Europe and the United States from AK Press. When did this come out? Uh, let's see. Relatively recently. It technically came out last year. Last year, yes. Um Although you were probably working on it for, you know, a good part of the last five years. So I see I started work on it when I was 21 and it was mm -hmm. released when I was 28. Okay. Um, so you've been working on this for a while. I, I know you, <laughs> I know your work from your YouTube channel and uh, funding essays that you've written uh, a lot of which you know because of my focus has been on the the contestation divides and overlaps between the history of anarchism and the history of marxism but i think today we're going to be talking a little bit broader than that um so uh, i guess uh, the, what one of the most ba basic questions there's are several histories of anarchism out there um what do you think your history added to the discussion? So I have a background in philosophy, uh, specifically like analytic philosophy. So it's all about clarity, rigor, stuff like that. And the idea was, is that I would use those analytic philosophy skills to systematically reconstruct the ideas of anarchism, such that a person doesn't just get a sense of what anarchists thought or events that happened, but crucially arguments for anarchist positions. Um, which I think makes it better for like understanding why anarchists thought about things the way they did, because there's a lot of histories of anarchism that don't give you the arguments. Instead, the focus is just on like people's lives or, you know, tracing uh, the history of like a concept or something. But I really wanted to focus in on, you know, this is why they rejected seizing state power. This is um, what they meant by freedom and how they used that to argue against uh, capitalism. Um, and so the, the term for this is like a rational reconstruction. So I'm reassembling anarchist ideas such that the logical connections between the components of it are explicit. Um, because there's a tendency for people to like, they, they read anarchist theory and because it's written for like a mass audience of workers who are either illiterate and having it read to them or, you know, have never actually had a formal education. It's in a very simple, direct style. And that leads people to mistake me thinking that anarchist theory is simplistic. And so I wanted to show the, com the intellectual complexity of it while at the same time also being you know, a history. Um, so I don't just talk about the ideas and arguments, but I try to ground them in the historical context and specifically the context of the, the anarchist movement and their actual attempts to put a uh, theory into practice. Um, because you know these were ideas that were written outside of universities. They were written by workers after a long day of work to be put into action by working class social movements. So I had to like ground it in that context. Um, and yeah, so that's what I think I was trying to do. I I found your book clarifying for, for a lot of the, uh, for a lot of the arguments. And I was vaguely aware that you had a background in analytic philosophy. Uh, I have a little bit of training in analytic philosophy and um, and it and it reads really clearly, but but you do go through the arguments fairly rigorously. Um, and I guess one of the things that we're gonna uh, t talk about, I, I use a phrase a lot called classical anarchism, and I I tend to mean by that anarchism up into the Spanish Civil War, uh, which I see, at least in the context of Europe, as a little different from anarchism after the Spanish Civil War, um, but maybe that's too broad of a brush because even when we're talking about classical anarchism we're talking about several different theories of of organization and praxis um but i wanted to to start off i mean anarchist view of the state uh is actually i think sometimes even contested amongst anarchists and when we talk about something like rejecting uh state power we we do need to know what anarchists thought the state was so um what were some of the anarchist views on the on the nature and definition of the state and how can that help us understand anarchist debates today 
So how anarchists define the state is really complex due to terminology. So some authors distinguish between government, which has existed since antiquity, and the state, which arose from the 16th or 17th century onwards as part of the emergence of capitalism. Um, so anarchists reject both government and the state, but the state is a historically specific form of government rather than all governments. Um, other anarchists use the word state to refer to both ancient governments, you know, like fifth century Athens and also modern nation states. And some just use the word government. They don't use the word state. Um, now, the consequence of this is that it's not always clear if an anarchist definition of the state is meant to apply just to the modern nation state or all governments across uh, human history. Uh, so I'm going to avoid this complexity by just focusing on what they definitely think about the modern uh, nation state. So they define it in terms of its powers, its function, and its organizational form. Uh, they think that the state is an institution in which a political ruling class, uh, such as kings, politicians, presidents, and so forth, wield the exclusive power to make laws and impose these laws on everyone within a given territory via mechanisms of institutionalized violence, police, prisons, the legal system, and so forth. And they think this power is wielded in order to perform the function of creating and maintaining the oppression and exploitation of the working classes by the ruling classes. And these ruling classes are composed of both the political ruling class, who directly wields state power, and the economic ruling class, uh, such as capitalists, bankers, aristocratic landowners. Um, so, you know, states enforce private property rights, they grant capitalist monopolies, they repress workers uh, when they go on strike, and thereby serve uh, the interests of the ruling classes. And for a lot of anarchists, that they also added in the clergy and like the, the church as a key extra thing that the state uh, serves the interests of. But that's obviously specific to certain countries where the church was very powerful, uh, like Spain. Um, now, anarchists didn't think that capitalism created the state in this kind of one directional manner. They thought that capitalism and the state co-created one another. So it's both that capitalists need the state to do things like, you know, repress workers, enforce private property rights, but also that the rulers of states actually also need uh, an economic ruling class um, in order to like maintain uh, their own power. Uh, and so they think there are these two classes with overlapping uh, class interests, which are sometimes opposed in complex ways, but often aligned together based on their shared interests in maintaining their power versus uh, the workers who they oppress. Um, now, states, of course, can do things that go beyond, you know, this pure class function, right? So like building roads, organizing education and healthcare. And so you should keep in mind that when anarchists are writing, the welfare state isn't really a thing yet. Um, you know, like when we think of states now, they're often doing things that historical states didn't do or just beginning to do. Uh, you know, when they're writing, the state primarily is the policeman who turns up at a strike to beat them up. Um, and you know, even like say the church is still organizing education in many of these contexts um, rather than in government education, but they update their analysis as the state takes on like more social functions. Um, and what they think is that this happens when you know, the state is forced to do this by social movements uh, or when it's in their interest, right? So like mass education through the state can create more educated workers who then have the skills needed for certain kinds of economic formations, like say, you know, with computing, um, you need loads of engineers and, you know, schools can generate that. Uh, or it's the case that, say, they're going to invest heavily in transportation systems because that can also be used to effectively deploy uh, troops in order to repress people. Uh, so the manner in which they do things which seemingly go beyond the function of serving the interests of the ruling classes also like entangled with that function or can be shaped by it, right? So you can have state uh, healthcare systems, but if you're from a certain country that's outside an arbitrary border, then, you know, you're not going to get free healthcare um, due to the state's ideas around citizenship. Uh, so lastly, uh, the state is structured in a hierarchical and centralized manner. Um, again and again, they say that the state is this pyramid in which a minority at the top commands and those beneath them obey. And they think this is uh, mediated or this chain of command occurs through a complex bureaucracy 
Uh, and some of them also have ideas about how the bureaucracy can have interests which are in also in turn distinct from both the you know, political ruling class at the top, like presidents and kings, uh, and the capitalist class. But they don't go into as much detail as I would like, but they seem to have like some sense of that, like Kropotkin. Uh, and they think that these three components, the, the power that the state has, its function and its organizational form, are interrelated with one another. So the state is structured in a hierarchical and centralized manner because of the function that it performs and was created to perform, which is establishing and maintaining the domination exploitation of the working classes by the ruling classes. And they think the state is able to perform this function due to its powers of institutionalized violence. And how these powers are exercised is in turn shaped by the organizational form. So, you know, within the legal system, there'll be this elaborate ranks of, you know, which court is above what, which judge over, overrules another judge and so forth. And in terms of how it's like useful, I think the historical anarchist analysis can help kind of shift away from like, I guess, like a crude economic reductionism where, you know, if the state does something, it's always because it serves the interests of capitalists. And the obvious problem with this is there are loads of times when states do things that don't serve the interests of capitalists or are done specifically to serve the interests of people in the state itself, right? So for example, in the UK, we recently had the Brexit referendum. Why did that happen? Well, a key reason is that the Prime Minister, uh, David Cameron, was trying to keep certain MPs within his party uh, happy. Um, and so his own distinct interests as, as a politician uh, led to him doing something that then, for example, has harmed the interests of certain businesses who've been very negatively affected by Brexit because it's, you know, turns out it was necessary for certain parts of like the economy to function how they were functioning. Um, and so I think that's like a useful conceptual system of, of thinking in terms of like different classes and class being defined not just in terms of economic class, but also in terms of your relationship to the means of institutionalized coercion, namely uh, the state. I think that's something modern anarchists should try and like build on and update because obviously society has changed since the 19th century and is you know more complicated. Um, yeah, those are some quick thoughts. Well, one of the things I appreciated about your books articulating the arguments is that there's a lot of Marxist assumptions that particularly after the Spanish Civil War, the anarchism is primarily a moral response to uh, to the state. And I think your book actually does a, a pretty good job of debucking that, at least for some anarchists. And recently I've been looking up class theories of this of, of the state. Um, and I remember when I was coming up, I was often taught that like, well, uh, anarchists reject simple class theories of the state. And, and what I actually uh, have learn partly from your book partly from the work of uh of wayne price is that's not so much true um it's just that so much of this language has been used by marxists but marxists themselves don't really have a particularly robust theory of what the state is i mean that lenin state revolution is about the best that you get um how do we view the like is the name uh, like uh can we view the state today in most anarchist theory as contiguous with or separate from the capitalist class? Like it clearly has its own interests, as you point out, and and not not considering its own interest often leads Marxists, for example, to make proclamations that frankly don't come true. <laughs> like you know, uh, but what what do you? Um, I guess one question that emerges to me that I'm just thinking off the cuff is that how would the anarchist response to the like almost comp competing elites within the state today? Like what's the what would be a, a, a classical anarchist uh, account for that? Would you think? No, I'm asking you to think on your feet. So. Yeah, I so, so Kropotkin has, you know, extensive analysis of the state in modern science and anarchy. Mm -hmm. It's probably the most detailed analysis of the state that I'm familiar with in, in anarchist theory. And in that, he emphasizes, like he has this um, list of classes that the state emerged to serve that have overlapping but distinct interests. And so he breaks it down, not just in terms of you know economic ones like landowners, capitalists, et cetera, but even with the political ruling class, he includes you know not only like presidents and monarchs, but also crucially say like the army, 
as, as so, so, uh, generals having distinct interests. Um, and so I think they would just want a, a more zoomed in version of what they already had, where they add in more variables. Because Kropotkin, he thinks in terms of interlocking tendencies, which either go in the same direction or clash with each other. And I think he would apply that to the state itself, where there are different factions within the state that are often in conflict uh, with one another in terms of their like competing interests. Um, so, for example, you know, there'll be a certain politician who's trying to push forward one thing, another politician's trying to prevent it. Or even within the bureaucracy, there are you know factions within the civil service and like the UK. And so I think they would just zoom in more and add more and more variables to like create an increasingly complex picture. But they wouldn't have any theoretical issues with doing so because they're already thinking in this way. It's just adding more detail to how they're already thinking. Um, and also certain variables that are less important now than they were historically, like the power of the church, for example, isn't what it was. Um, so one question that comes to mind immediately would be um, how, for example, would a lot of anarchists uh, deal with parliamentarism or, congr or congressional democracy with the state? And um, it is clear to me that, you know, really, I mean, that's the first debate that separates anarchism proper from Marxism proper as debates around electoralism and the first international. Um, so why why have anarchists traditionally seen parliamentarism as such a particular trap um yeah it is the star wars meme of it's a trap <laughs> is what they were saying um so the, okay the argument is that when the activity you engage in transforms you independently of your intentions and so that it's not about good intentions, it's not about ideas, it's about the day-to-day -day activity you're engaging in and the social structure you're participating in. They're the key factors in determining what you do and why you act the way you do. And so they think that due to this uh, kind of three-way interaction between people's consciousness, structure, and actions, that elect you have to analyze, well, what kind of activity is electoral politics and how does it transform social movements? And they think is that what it will result in is so first of all, in order to you know, get voted into the first place, people will water down their socialist politics to appeal to as many people as possible, um, which, you know, for context, at the time, universal suffrage wasn't a thing. So it's going to be especially, you know, men rather than women. It's going to be men who own property because there are some situations where people without property don't have the vote or where people with property have more votes. And, you know, there's loads of like variables like that that make parties have interest to appeal to those bases, like say small business owners. Um, uh, and so over time, they'll water down their socialist politics, even though the idea was, well, we're going to go into parliament to spread socialist ideas. What's going to end up happening is that you're going to increasingly not be advocating those ideas in order to be electorally effective. Uh, second of all, they're going to develop an interest in stopping um, disruptive direct action on the grounds that it might scare voters away. So the interests of the party will become a conf in opposition to the interests of workers engaging in direct action and the party will try and stop them from doing that, which if you're a socialist is a bad idea because they're wanting to like, mobilize workers uh, themselves with their own direct action. They also think it's politicians who enter the state are gonna be transformed by it and they're gonna come primarily concerned with maintaining their own power uh, rather than what they were initially there to do, which is, you know, long-term goal of, of abolishing the state. Uh, so it's going to move us away from the goal of state abolition rather than towards it, irrespective of intentions. And the other claim they make is it's also going to negatively affect workers. So rather than them learning how to self-organize and take direct action, they're going to be listening to politicians make speeches and promises. They're going to put their hope in the party. They're going to wait for politicians to save them rather than them organizing themselves. And if a revolutionary situation arises, well, they're already used to just voting someone into power and trusting them to sort everything out. So that's what they'll then do in a revolution, which will then move away from the kinds of working class self-organization, which is necessary to achieve uh, socialism, namely you know, workers' councils, essentially. Um, so those are like the, the rough, off the top of my head, kind of points they make about why 
it, it, it's, a, it's a bad idea just from the point of view of, of achieving socialism. So it's not like a moral argument, it's a practical one, which is that, well, if you have this goal, this is a form of action that's going to take you away from where you want to go rather than towards it. And so they're always talking about, they're always evaluating strategy in terms of the unity of means and ends. So, you know, we've got our end goal, uh, uh, stateless class of society, and we need means that actually move to us towards this rather than towards creating a, a new kind of class society. How would that contrast with how you view, say, the Marxist stance on electoralism? And I'll just caveat that with the fact that I kind of see Marxist stances um, not entirely coherent if I try to make sense of all the writings he ever did. <laughs> so, so I'll just leave that at that. So what yeah. do you think the difference would be? So Marx can be quite vague about specifics. You know, he has like lines that can then you can read all kinds of thing into, right? So it'll be like, you know, we need to organize the working class into a political party aimed at the conquest of political power. Well, someone, you know, certain people interpret that as obviously this means, you know, we don't do electoral politics, we just do armed uprisings and seize the state. While others are like, yes, this obviously means second international social democracy. In terms of what he actually advocated, you know, he does write the program for the French Workers' Party. And in that, he does refer to universal suffrage as a means of emancipation. There's, you know, the interview he gives after the Paris Commune, where he says that in Europe, it might be through insurrection, but in places like the UK, it can be through peaceful means. So he seems to have a contextualist view where which what we should be engaging in varies. But in general, he is in favor of engaging in electoral politics in order to essentially spread socialist ideas. Um, and he, and he doesn't, at least in what I've read, so you know, I'm not like a Marx scholar, I've read a lot of him, but I haven't read, you know, all complete works in German, etc. cetera. Um, but from what I've read, he, he doesn't kind of go into those kinds of details because it, you know, he, he, he's writing for himself as opposed to he is in, you know, this party and he is saying, this is what this party needs to do. Um, He's so, so therefore he doesn't there's certain kinds of questions and topics which he doesn't go into for that reason. And mm -hmm. instead, I think a lot of the writings about Marxist electoral politics are like Engels's letters to members of various social democratic parties where they're asking for his advice. Um and you know he he absolutely advocates you know electoral politics and attacks the anarchists for being against it. But something I'm still kind of figuring out is to what extent did they view it as necessary for seizing state power as opposed to just building up a party that can then seize state power. Uh, like I, they, I, I'm, all, I'm still unsure of the extent to which they were like in favor of an electoral road to socialism because mm. you know early on they have this like two-stage model. First, we have the democratic revolution that establishes a republic, the ready-made state form, as Engels calls it. Um, and that has gives us all the things we need, like certain rights, like freedom of speech, et cetera, to organize a mass workers' party, which can then conquer state power. And so then we have the socialist revolution after the first uh, democratic revolution. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I feel I'm still trying to figure out the specifics. And I think it's easier to you know talk about, well, what did you know the Social Democratic Party of Germany think? And what did the different factions within it think? I think that there's way more hard evidence. And I think with Marx, there's a lot more in, big interpretive questions in part due to like vague language and certain things he just doesn't talk about. Um, yeah, uh, one of the things that I have realized in studying the, the history of Marx and Lenin is how many concepts uh, come from non-Marxist factions uh, in the in the Second International get blended with Marxist ones and we just kind of take them as always being there. The big example is democratic centralism. Uh, you know, that's that comes from LaSalle's faction, not not Marx's. And yet, you know, by the time we get to Kotsky and Lenin, it runs through the whole thing and it's just assumed. Um, so it, it is interesting to me to look at that. But then I also look at other Marxists, like, for example, uh, um, the the Bordigist and Dementist section of left communists who uh, almost take a harder line towards any any involvement with anything democratic at all uh than any than most anarchists historically did 
So it's it's a very it ends up being kind of a a mess. Um, you know, can we talk a little bit about like what was the what was the early anarchist strategy um, for achieving workers' power in the nineteenth and early twentieth century? Okay, um, that's a huge topic because it's there's many of. different kind of anarchists. So I'm gonna. Uh, cheat and just talk about what the majority thought rather than getting into like there's this sub faction of sub factions of sub factions who have this view you know, I'm just going to go broad brush strokes this is what most people think this is what you're going to find in Bakudin, Kropotkin, Malatesta and so forth okay so what do they think well they, they distinguish between uh, periods of evolution and periods of revolution so evolution is slow, gradual, and partial change. Revolution is rapid, fundamental, large-scale change. And they want a social revolution, which abolishes capitalism and the state simultaneously uh, in favor of um, organs of worker self-management, like community councils, workplace councils, and organs of armed self-defense, so uh, workers' militias. Uh, and this revolution, they think, requires both expropriating the capitalist class and also violently destroying uh, the state. Uh, so there's a common straw man of like, oh, you know, anarchists ignore the need for violent confrontations of power. And then you read them and they're just like unbelievably pro taking up guns to <laughs> defeat the state. Um, they, you know, in many ways are actually more pro violence of a certain kind than you, I can like find in Marx, for example, um, certain like wings of anarchism in particular. Uh, but anyway, so the question for anarchists then is, well, how do we go from an evolutionary period to the revolutionary period or when the, the social revolution uh, occurs? And the majority of anarchists uh, since the First International argued that we should form mass working class social movements which struggle for immediate reforms in the present by direct action and are organized in a manner that prefigures an anarchist society. So they use the same system of you know, bottom-up decision-making, they're coordinated uh, through federations, there are general assemblies in which people have a say in decisions, uh, rather than you know a top-down uh, kind of centralized structure. And they think the goal is to uh, win these reforms, so you know shorter working hours, better pay, and also even like political rights, like you know freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, by engaging in direct action that impose costs onto the ruling classes, such that they acquire an incentive to give in to the demands of workers. The obvious example being a strike where the, the capitalist loses money, that their business can't go on. So in order to preserve themselves as a capitalist, they have to do what the workers uh, want. Um, and anarchists historically did this, you know, and like won the Ain Tower Day in Spain. They played a key role in winning the weekend in France. Um, and so the main social movement that anarchism historically was always tied to was like the trade union movement. And anarchism has been biggest when it has been a mass trade union movement. Um, and they, the idea was is that we want reforms, but not reformism. So it's reforms as a means to a re revolution, as opposed to, you know, we can just gradually erode capitalism until it collapses. Like they still advocate a revolutionary confrontation. And so they think that we have to engage in the struggle for reform in a manner that develops the, a social force that is driven to incapable of initiating a social revolution. As so this goes back you know, to the unity of means and ends. And that's part of why they advocate the kinds of struggles that they do, right? So with trade unions, for example, the idea is, is workers aren't just going to change the world, like, you know, winning a strike, getting better wages. They're also going to change themselves in certain respects through the kind of activity they're engaging in. Um, so they might, you know, learn to take initiative and act for themselves rather than waiting for a politician to save them. They develop class consciousness. They learn anarchist theory. Uh, they develop the capacity to horizontally associate with others, you know, through their experiences in general assemblies. And in so doing, workers are gonna become the kinds of people who can then create an anarchist society because we need people with these consciousness, with these drives, with these capacities in order for society to actually be reorganized at a, like a macro scale with you know, everything collapsing. And they think this process uh, would repeat over time such that you get an increasingly large number of workers who go from only aiming at small improvements within existing society uh, to being revolutionaries who are organized and united as a class within federations, like mass organizations, like millions of people, and they've developed initiative to act for themselves. And what this means then is that the mass movements have been generated by the struggle for reform can then, 
under the right kind of objective circumstances, you know, like an economic crisis, a war, things like that, initiate um, waves of insurrection, which they call the period of incubation between evolution and revolution. And that will turn uh, a revolutionary situation into a revolutionary period. Then anarchists intervene in the revolutionary period as an organized mass movement in order to ensure that it becomes a social revolution, so it abolishes capitalism and the state, and that workers are creating an anarchist society, so they're using anarchist systems of organization and decision making, even if they don't actually identify as anarchists. And what this means is that what the workers who are participating in those forms of organization, of you know, bottom-up worker self-management, uh, they're going to be transformed through their experiences of doing so in a similar way to how the workers who joined the, the struggles for reform were in the evolutionary period. Uh, so they think in terms of a militant minority that's going to create the revolutionary period. Uh, and this is a militant minority, you know, that's not like 50 people. It's, you know, a mass movement of, of organized workers on a huge scale. It's just that historically uh, trade unions have always composed a, you know, numerically minority of, of workers, right? Uh, even the biggest social movements don't literally mobilize the entire country uh, in like one go, especially you know, outside of like a revolution. And so they think that, well, this minority that will then become the majority during the revolutionary period itself. Um, and then that majority, you know, reorganize society on like an anarchist basis. And then we go back into an evolutionary period where we continue to like refine and figure out better ways of living together, trial and error, figure out, you know, how can we actually structure a socialist economy? Um, so they think this process is continuous. It's not just like, um, yeah, we've achieved anarchism, everything's fine. It's like they're, they're constantly framing things in terms of a never ending process of developing and figuring out better ways of realizing uh, anarchist goals. Uh, one last point is that a significant number of anarchists, it's hard to figure out how many, think that in order for this process of social revolution you know, to occur, anarchists need to not only organize in mass movements, open to all workers like you know, trade unions um, and so forth, they should also organize what are called specific anarchist organizations, which unite anarchist revolutionaries in order to develop correct theory and strategy, coordinate their action both among themselves and within broader mass organizations, uh, and push the revolutionary struggle forward by persuasion and engaging in actions that provide an example to others. So it's not kind of authoritarian vanguardism where they're taking everything over and ordering everyone out, out and you know the specific anarchist organization doesn't take power and establish like a one-party dictatorship uh they're just within mass struggle as a militant minority persuading people talking to people spreading their ideas and they emphasize again again engaging actions that provide an example so you know you see a bunch of workers expropriate their workplace and that then makes other people go we should copy that <laughs> um and they think that the point of this specific anarchist organization is also to counteract the tendency of mass movements to become reformist over time and abandon revolutionary goals or for the revolutionary period to you know, result in the establishment of a new ruling class uh, rather than uh, you know, a, a social revolution. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's an attempt to briefly summarize what most anarchists thought, um, but it's very complicated. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is uh, an incredibly broad question. I guess one thing we can get into when we talk about um, early anarchism is what were the various broad tendencies? I don't want to go into like every single possible tendency that ever emerged in the 19th century. <laughs> um, you know, uh, as someone who has, has tried to like document this for both anarchists and marxists, it, yeah, that can become exhaustive in and of itself just within a within one tendency. But uh, what were the broad tendencies of anarchists in the 19th and early 20th century? So um, in the book, I use this like distinction from a story called Lucien van der Vol, where he distinguishes between mass anarchism and what was insurrection anarchism. I'm not a fan of the terminology because it leads to people misunderstanding things like the the insurrectionist anarchists were in favor of a mass movement and the mass anarchists were in favor of insurrection. So they're not ideal terms, but I couldn't come up with better ones. Uh, but the basic distinction is what I just explained in the previous like segment, that's like mass anarchism. So mass formal organizations generating a social force capable and driven to achieve a social revolution through the struggle for immediate reform via direct action. 
what, what Van der Volk calls the insurrectionist anarchists, uh, which used a variety of terms. Often they just call themselves anarchist communists. Other times they call them anti they call themselves anti organizationists. Some call themselves individualist anarchists, but they aren't into Max Stirner, so they don't mean that. Um, what they uh, think is that, that they reject organizing through formal federations and advocate just organizing uh, through affinity groups and informal social networks uh, between those affinity groups. Mass anarchists also advocated affinity groups. They just didn't only advocate them. They also advocated uh, federations. Uh, so like the CNT, for example, had loads of affinity groups within it, uh, um, but also was itself a, a, a formal organization. Um, and they thought that these affinity groups, the insurrectionists thought these affinity groups should engage uh, in an escalating series of uh, armed uh, attacks or revolts um, that create this kind of chain reaction of uprisings. Um, and this was kind of very much inspired by uh, the Paris Commune initially. So, you know, we just got to keep doing Paris Communes because look how much the Commune spread. Socialism, Italians, you know, anarchism and socialism emerge in Italy due to the Paris Commune. Loads of key people become interested in socialism because of the communes. They think, okay, we just got to keep doing insurrectionary waves. And that will over time generate increasingly large numbers of mobilized workers who are radicalized and then will eventually, you know, have a culminate in, in a revolution. Uh, their initial attempts at doing this don't work out. And so that over time, there's this kind of switch from m attempts at like mass insurrection or at least inspiring mass insurrection uh, in favor of assassinations and bombings. Um, and this is, you know, what is known as propaganda of the deed. Um, and they think that, you know, these actions will like spread ideas uh, and, and, and inspire workers to rebel because they can see that the ruling class can be attacked. And um, anyway, so, so that's brief attempt to summarize the anti-organizationists. Um, but yeah, it's, there's some complications, but even that aside, uh, that's what they generally uh, think. And then within mass anarchism, there's loads of different subcategories depending on broadly speaking two questions, which is, you know, what do we think about trade unions and what do we think about specific anarchist organizations? So there are um, people who advocate what's called pure syndicalism uh, or revolutionary syndicalism, which is the idea that the, the revolutionary trade union is sufficient unto itself to achieve anarchist goals. We don't need a specific anarchist organization. We just participate in the trade union and the trade union is an organization that can achieve our goals and we, we don't need uh, other things. Then there are the proponents of organizational dualism who are like, no, we need both the mass org and the specific anarchist org. So trade unions are not sufficient in and of themselves. That's what like Malatesta and Kropotkin think. And then the questions like, well, there's a separate question, which is, should the trade union be explicitly committed to like an anarchist program, which is what anarchist syndicalism is, so, like the CNT, uh, originally isn't committed to anarchism explicitly and then later is and the people who advocate it being committed to anarchist communism um, and rejecting state socialism are called anarcho-syndicalists. Uh, then within uh, organizational dualism there's basically differences about different labels for essentially you know how should we make decisions, uh, how, what should be in our program. So some for example think we have to have this like narrow program uh, and others want a much broader one that includes basically anyone who calls themselves an anarchist. Uh, some want it where majority decisions at Congress are binding on everyone within the organization, irrespective of what you think. Uh, and others think uh, that's a bad idea. And instead, it should, major, majority decisions should only be binding on those who voted in favor of them. The program is still binding on everyone because that's a requirement for entering the organization, but decisions at the Congress independently of the program are only binding on those who vote in favor of them. So that's roughly the different subtypes on, on those kind of key questions. Hmm. Um, one thing that comes to mind is I've done a lot of research on syndicalism and both anarcho and otherwise, and I wanted to um maybe ask you to clarify what is the what is the substantive difference between anarcho syndicalism um and syndicalism in general such as the syndicalism of like william z foster or, or someone like that and councilism so this is still something i'm figuring out um with 
one one obvious difference is that there are some syndicalists who were pro electoral politics. So they thought the trade union should be independent of political parties, but they also thought workers should organize in political parties and electoral politics was fine. Um, there were some syndicalists who would advocate a lot of anarchist ideas, but deny that any of them came from anarchism and attack anarchism as like individualist and all the bad things. Like the, I remember reading one French syndicalist who, you know, who did this, who wrote this long thing about syndicalism and anarchism with nothing in common, even though even this isn't true. Uh, he he later collaborated with the Vichy government and became like a fascist. <laughs> um, so it's kind of uh, bizarre some of the journeys people go on. Um, but obviously, you know, not all syndicates, it was just one random French guy. Right? Um, then with respect to like council communism, so the off the top of my head, the, the um, program of the um, council communists in Germany is like very anti-trade union uh, mm -hmm. because the trade unions collaborated with uh, the war along with the social democratic party. So like we have to reject both uh, the social democrats and the trade unions because they're that they collaborated um, with, with uh, World War One, and so abandoned internationalism. Uh, and this then leads people to think, well, if they're anti-union and syndicalism is pro-union, then they have nothing in common. Uh, and what this ignores is that for the syndicalists, they were also against kind of bureaucratic reformist trade unions. That's why they advocated syndicalist ones as uh, and often emerged out of splits from bureaucratic trade unions. Um, second of all, they didn't view the trade union as an end of itself. So the, the standard position was that the, the syndicalist trade union is building the new world in the shell of the old. So during the revolution, the union sections will go from you know, struggling against the boss and become the organization for which the economy is self-managed. However, they weren't dogmatic about this idea. So during the Russian revolution, uh, the Russian anarcho-syndicalists were actually against participating in the trade unions because they were so entangled with uh, state socialism and the Bolsheviks, and instead they advocated uh, participating in the factory committees, so like the workers' councils. Um, and that's very much in line with some of the things that, you know, the, the council communists said. Um, but I, in terms of detailed specifics, it's, it's kind of, it's still something I'm trying to figure out because, you know, there can be differences in language, but not ideas. So, you know, what the council communists think is a, is a workers' state through you know the council system, anarcho syndicalists could look at that and go like, "Oh, that's just what I advocate," but I don't think it's a state, right? Um, but there might be specific differences on how to go about organizing that system of workers' councils where there are uh, disagreements. But it's something I'm still trying to like figure out because um, I wasn't able to do that when I was like writing this book. This is for the next one about anarchism versus Marxism. Where I'm going to try and actually establish what do we actually agree and disagree about. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, but it, it's interesting to me when I try to deal with the substance of these debates because when I've gone through some of them, I have been like, we're just not under understanding each other's languages and frameworks. And sometimes the frameworks look similarly because they use some of the same words, but they use them differently. Or, um, it, it, it's it's an interesting thing to to kind of parse for me uh, for for similar reasons because I have been like, okay, what. Well, Clearly, we're getting caught up on just the word syndicate versus the word council, but what some of these groups actually believe uh, are our practice is a much different matter. And I guess this kind of breaks me to like the er uh, conflict between uh, anarchist and Marxist, uh, being that you know, our well, anarchism doesn't really have a founder, but Marxism undoubtedly starts with Marx. Um, in what way did the debate between Bakunin and Marx change the way anarchists were headed? Um, it, it, did it lead to, like, I, I think from your book, I kind of gathered it led to the development of platformism and all kinds of, even early on, all kinds of different Marxisms. I think, I think one of the the interesting things is when everyone tells me like, oh, I believe in Orthodox Marxism. Like that was a contested term by like 1890. I don't know what you mean by that. Um, <laughs> so uh, in what ways do you think that that conflict really did set up uh, a lot of tendencies that were going to come later? So that's obviously a big, um, Another big so, so 
<laughs> I think it's important to separate the history of the international and the ideas that developed within it from okay. the conflict, right? So if you look at the history of the international and the actual um, resolutions that are passed by sections of it, they're essentially advocating syndicalism before it was a thing. Um, all the core cool ideas that syndicalists advocated were first advocated in the international. So, you know, the, the trade unions the, as the new world in the shell of the old, um, the idea of, you know, struggling for reform to build up a mass movement, uh, the emphasis on, you know, the collective ownership of the means of production and land, workers taking direct action, even opposition to electoral politics was advocated by some sections of the international that became anarchist, but at the time didn't use the label. Um, and so those things clearly, you know, led to anarchism. Um, but with respect to the conflict between uh, Marx and Bakunin, it really centers around an organization called uh, the Alliance. That's the kind of driving force of the drama. So Bakunin advocates, you know, organizational dualism. So we have a mass public org open to all workers and the secret specific anarchist organization of dedicated revolutionaries. Um, he thinks the, the specific anarchist org should be secret, not for like nefarious reasons, but to avoid state repression. Um, and he tries to put hit this theory he has into practice by transforming his existing social networks, because he was kind of like a social butterfly, into an organization. Uh, and th there's various attempts that don't really work out, they can't go under different names, like the Brotherhood, the International Brotherhood, and finally the Alliance. The history of the Alliance is itself a mess, because there's, you know, at various times, multiple different organizations that all called the Alliance, but all different and have different histories, and it's very complicated. Um, but the key thing to emphasize is that there's this or there's this kind of loose social network within the international that is not a formal organization uh, and it just contains key members of the collectivist wing of the international which is what the anarchist movement develops out of so not all collectivists become anarchists uh, but all anarchists were initially collectivists and it has meetings and Bakunin writes loads of letters uh, but you know it didn't have congresses it didn't have delegates it wasn't like a proper specific anarchist organization. It was really just a loose social network. It has a program that Bakunin writes, uh, but because membership is really based on Bakunin's social butterfly nature, there are people who are technically in the Alliance who don't actually agree with its program and are just there because Bakunin's like, you should join. Um, and it wasn't, you know, like a secret society like the Freemasons, because uh, there's so often it's claimed that it is like that, but it wasn't, there weren't rituals, there weren't ceremonies, all the primary sources point this out. Um, now, members of the Alliance were really important in uh, creating the first anarchist movements uh, and sections of the international in Italy and Spain. And the Spanish anarchists, they create uh, an organization which is also called the Alliance, but is different from Bakunin's Alliance as a social network, uh, but there is some overlap between key people. Uh, and then once the international is fully up and running in, in Spain, they've had very successful congresses. It's you know, absolutely massive. Uh, the Spanish anarchists and the Alliance vote to actually dissolve the organization because they're like, well, we've done what we set out to do. Uh, and Bakunin writes letters being like, no, it has this you know, role as a unite revolutionaries, et cetera. And they like ignore him. Um, now, the reason why this is relevant is that um, Marx thinks that Bakunin is the dictator of this organization called the Alliance that's plotting to take over the international and essentially turn it into his like fiefdom. He's going to like impose anarchism on the international. And so Marx then sees congresses that are voting against electoral politics as really just being an extension of Bakunin's nefarious plot, as opposed to workers in this part of the world have their own ideas, have thought about it and arrived at this view that disagrees with Marx. Uh, Marx instead sees this as like Bakunin's plot. And the reason why he thinks this because this is what he's been told by people who, who, who he knows, um, like a, a guy called uh, Uten. Now, this false belief that there's this conspiracy to essentially turn the, what should be a working class organization into Bakunin's fiefdom, who's, you know, Russian aristocrat, uh, leads them to go, well, we're going to do our own secret conspiracy to make the international committed to state socialist strategy to expel uh, Bakunin from the organization. Uh, and, you know, Engels will write letters being like, how can Bakunin think that atheism should be part of the program of the international? He's so silly about this. 
And then you read Bakun, and Bakun's like, well, yeah, the program of the Alliance obviously shouldn't be the program of the international. Uh, so, you know, there are loads of workers who believe, who believe in God, and we can't exclude them by making atheism part of our program, but it should be part of the program of the, the organization of revolutionaries. Now, the reason why this whole history is relevant, because, you know, is that after, so Bakunin dies in 1876. Now, key anarchists uh, who develop a lot of the theory were members of this social network called the Alliance. And that includes like Malatesta. Um, and also there's a successor to it with a um, slightly different name called something like the Intimate International. And Kropotkin's a part of that. Uh, and they continue to advocate Bakunin's theory of, of organizational uh, dualism. And it's out, and then over time, you know, this culminates um, in platformism as a particular version of it. Um, but the starting point is Bakunin, and then the flame is carried on by people who knew him, who were in the alliance, who then at, found actual formal organizations in the way that Bakunin um, was never able to. He was never able to actually really put his idea into practice despite trying to. Um, so it's kind of interesting that like a failed attempt at an idea is, is, is but it continues onwards after the the collapse of the international due to the, uh, all the feuds. Um, in terms of how it led to development of various forms of Marxism, I'm not, I'm not too sure about that because so, you know, the, the early big Marxist social movements are like in Germany and Austria, which weren't really involved in the international. Like Germany kind of gets involved with the Hague, but aren't really invested in it. It's just because Marx and Engels keep writing letters insisting that they join so they can expel Bakunin with a majority. Um, and I feel like though that those kind of social democratic movements would have been heading towards Marxism, regardless of like the Marx uh, Bakunin conflict, like how it played out. I think it did become part of like the mythology of both movements in terms of how they think of themselves, um, because they both wrote, you know, accounts of what happened in which their side is right and the other is wrong and so forth. Um, but I'm not I'm not sure of how it shaped Marxism beyond the explicit commitment to the conquest of political power and the formation of a, a political party, which is one of the resolutions that Marx and Engels push forward at the London conference and then later at The Hague. Um, so yeah, that's an attempt to <laughs> answer that. Yeah, I, I think where things get a little muddy for me in that is the, the Italian anarchist and the Italian Marxist because Mm -hmm. there's a lot more overlap there and people going back and forth between the red and the black internationals and um well in, in italy the the first socialist movement is anarchists and they actually introduce marx into italy they do the first translations or summaries mm -hmm. uh after the failure of propaganda of the deed you get some people like andrea costa who become you know favorable electoral politics because it's like well the thing we tried really didn't work out at all um, so I'm going to try something new and then other people, you know, stick to anarchism, uh, like Malatesta and attack Costa, uh, for like, you know, betraying the movement. Um, and often this slide is weirdly entangled with repression because what happens is some people get the idea of protest candidates where there's a guy in jail and we're going to elect him into parliament and then, you know, they're going to have to let him out basically. Um, and so people even put like Malatesta's name, they try to make him go on the ballot and he has to write letters being like, no, don't make me a, an electoral candidate. I'm an anarchist. I will stay in prison. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that can win. But that was like, you know, once you start doing it for protest, then it's easy to go, well, why not do it for other things? And it kind of, you know, snowballs, right? Um, so so I guess in, yeah, the, the Italian Socialist Party. Yeah. Um... I guess I was going to ask you then, um, what is anarchist platformism and how does it affect things? <laughs> so, let's just be okay. That. Um, so platformism is a tendency that arises after the Russian Revolution by mm -hmm. key participants and especially the revolution in Ukraine. So people like Nestor Makhno, Peter Arshinov, uh, is also Ida Met. Um, and they look back at basically their defeat in the Russian Revolution and try and think, well, what can anarchists do to succeed after that failure? And also because they're looking at the state of the anarchist movement and in certain places it's not doing great. Um, and they're worried about essentially the rise of, of Bolshevism taking over anarchism as the main 
movement internationally as opposed to just in Europe. Like, you know, there was anarchism was bigger in South America than Marxism was at the time, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so they propose that the specific anarchist organization should be committed to a narrow program as opposed to so it shouldn't include individualists. It should, it, it should just unite, you know, uh, anarchist communists essentially uh, under shared uh, strategy such that the organization is all moving in one direction rather than, you know, one section of the organization wants to organize in trade unions and other things. It's not a bad idea. And then they're engaging in like contradictory action. It's like, no, the, the organization should all be moving in one direction in order to allocate, you know, limited resources and energy to achieving specific concrete goals. And so in order to enable this, what's called theoretical and tactical unity, they think we need uh, a, a system of binding majority voting, which did exist in some mass organizations like the CNT. So, you know, majority Congress resolutions binding on everyone in the organization. Uh, but that wasn't really a thing in specific anarchist organizations, which were much smaller and where there wasn't as much of a necessity for it because both of the size and the fact that, you know, the entire membership is anarchist versus where there's a, you know, strong anarchist base in it, but loads of people join just because they want to be in a union. Um, and the, um, the, the binding Congress resolutions in order to enable that, and then also what they call um, collective responsibility, which basically just means you, you, you agree to do the things that we all agreed on, <laughs> as opposed to essentially like a lack of discipline, like let's say we need revolutionary discipline uh, in order to achieve our, our goals, um, and that they frame it in terms of the organization's responsible for its members and its members are responsible for the organization, which roughly just means that insofar as you're a member, you act in a way that aligns with the common program, and the common program is in turn um, a reflection of like what you think. Um, but what happens is that they they phrase all these ideas in such a way that to some anarchists it essentially sounds like anarcho-bolshevism and it gets misunderstood as saying that essentially the specific anarchist organization is going to be like an authoritarian vanguard it's going to rule over the workers it's going to establish you know one party state based on you know what can sound like democratic centrism uh and they then have to issue all these clarifications of like, no, we don't mean this, we don't mean that, we don't want to be an authoritarian vanguard. But that all gets forgotten, and everyone just remembers the initial response and not the uh, the follow up um, where they clarify everything. Because the original title for the platform includes the word draft in the title, and it really was a draft. And I think they should have worked longer on the draft before releasing it. Um, but they weren't ready, I don't think, for the discourse. Um, but yeah, anyway, and platformism was always like really small in the historical mm. movement after all this drama. Um, it briefly takes over, or takes over, it briefly becomes adopted by the uh, specific anarchist organization in France. Uh, but a few years later, what called synthesis to like the enemies of the platformists who want a broader program, don't want binding majority decision making, they um, regain control of the organization. Uh, the, uh, and, and it never becomes a big thing. It's only actually much later than now we have, like in the modern world, all these platformist groups. You know, there are more platformists now than there were historically, um, which is often not the case for anarchist stuff. You know, there were more anarcho syndicalists historically than there are now, but with platformism, it's the, it's the other way around. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, platformism is often. Uh, for good and ill, it's like, oh, that's the anarchists that agree with the Marxists the most, maybe. Um, so, that's... well, yeah, well, I would argue that it's really just expanding what anarchists have been advocating since Bakunin. Um, <laughs> and, and like Malatesta, like, writes these letters in which they're, you know, in which he says on a number of topics, it's just a difference of language. They actually advocate the same thing. And really, it's just that there are a few slight differences between what Malatesta advocates and what the platformists advocate. So he wants a slightly broader program, and he rejects the, the binding majority decision making. He thinks it's incompatible with the unity of means and ends. Um, so he, he thinks he'll create an organization that isn't capable of achieving an anarchist society. One of the things I learned from your book um, is that I have always, I was actually convinced by the Kotsky critique of the general strike and Sorel's you know, I guess response to that was to try to make it a myth. 
Um, but your book clarified to me that 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 Kotsky was actually responding to a straw man <laughs> um, that, that most anarchists and socialists who believed in general strike did not actually believe it was this, you know, unitary event, which immediately abolishes, um, uh, you know, capitalism. So what was the anarchist understanding of the general strike in the 19th and early 20th century? Okay. So I can frame this in terms of a response to the straw man, right? So like the big straw man's are, I think you can pick a pre-planned day for revolution and just do the revolutionary general strike whenever you want. Uh, but it assumes that, you know, we're gonna have all most workers in the country in a union, and then they all go on strike together in like one big go, which, you know, isn't gonna happen because there's never been union organizations that are that large, right? Um, third, it re requires that capitalism will collapse just due to workers essentially folding their arms, ceasing work, and then, yay, class is abolished. Um, fourth, that it only focuses on defeating capitalists and ignores the need for political struggle uh, against the capitalist state. So these critiques do apply to some proponents of the general strike, uh, especially the very early ones um, and also some sections of, this, of early French syndicalism. But they don't apply to what anarchists uh, meant when they talked about the general strike. And this is, you know, from the debates in the first international onwards. So they're very explicit that the general strike, the, so we need to distinguish between a revolutionary general strike and just a general strike, right? You can have a general strike to win the eight hour day, which is what they did in Spain, but it wasn't a revolutionary one. Um, so a revolutionary general strike, they didn't think it could be launched on a pre-planned day. They instead think it's gonna develop out of smaller strikes uh, for immediate improvements that over time become a strike wave and they grow in frequency and size until a point's reached where the strike wave has created a revolutionary situation. And then a revolutionary general strike becomes possible because so many workers are mobilized and class conscious and taking action that then we can push to, towards the, the, the revolution. Um, and they think, they think their task is that there are a militant minority of workers who are gonna organize key industries that the economy can't function without, in particular shipping, railways, uh, energy, things like that because this acts as a force multiplier, which is that, you know, if we stop shipping and railways and energy, well then raw materials aren't being moved, factories can't work. And, and, and this means that a strike by one sector of the economy can have a massive effect on the entire economy. So we don't have to organize, you know, all the workers in all the industries, we just got to focus on strategically uh, significant industries. Um, and that this will force, you know, workers outside of the strike to stop work and thereby potentially be politicized and, and, and mobilized into the, the strike wave. Um, and this is something they realized from, you know, actual real world experience, like the London Dockland strike in 1989, which begins as a small strike. And then over two weeks, there's this like mass mobilization that shuts down the entire dock and factories have to close because the supply chain's messed up. And this, you know, ends in winning like, you know, some better wages, but the anarchists see this and go, what if we did this, but bigger? <laughs> And it was organized by anarchists, trade unions, rather than, you know, what was uh, this kind of reformist thing. Uh, and they think that this uh, mass strike wave, it creates a situation where the militant minority, they can initiate expropriation of the means of production and establish workers' control. So workers aren't folding their arms and waiting for capitalism to collapse. They're expropriating. And the idea is that, you know, the strike committee, well, that can transform into a workers' council, uh, for example and that this will inspire workers elsewhere to engage in expropriation so that what becomes a, what starts as a strike wave becomes an expropriation wave and crucially again it's a process it's not you know in one day it, it's based it's, it, it's based on the idea of it spreading over time obviously you know not over the course of several years you know it's going to be in a relatively short space of time but it's not like you know in a few hours um and they they always emphasize this need of you know the general strike with expropriation is what makes it revolutionary as opposed to just a normal general strike where you, you know you're just not at work and trying to get better wages and they were aware especially from practical experience that the state's not just going to sit around right they're going to be trying to repress the strike wave from the beginning and so therefore they thought it was necessary for the trade union to have a pre-organized armed division of action groups who would be in place to attack the police and military or persuade them to um you know put down their weapons basically
uh, and that they would also you know, seize weapons from armories and distribute them to workers and other workers are armed. Uh, and so rather than ignoring the question of political power, they actually advocate smashing the state and replacing it with working class power. Uh, and so they don't ignore the need for, they don't, the general strike, revolution drone strike isn't purely economic, it's a platform from which to, look, to launch the social revolution, just because it mobilizes so many people and causes so much disruption. Uh, and the CNT did have these action groups who when the, they were, you know, they were preparing for a situation like this, but then what actually happens is there's a fascist coup but the action groups mobilize and they already know, you know, all the shooting positions, where troops are stationed, where weapons are, so they can then defeat the fascist coup um, in, in, you know, significant parts of Spain. And that's because they've been preparing for, you know, what their theory said they needed to. It's just it occurred in response to a fascist coup rather than a massive strike wave. Um, yeah. So that that actually is significantly clear. One thing that I was surprised in going through your history about, and I think we're going to, I'm going to use this to pivot just for a brief bit, and then we'll wrap this up, on the difference between anarchism and between, like, say, the 1960s and the 19, or the 2010s in the, in the broadly speaking, West. I always use the West in quotation marks. I'm not even sure it's a coherent idea. Um, but uh, one of the differences is that the anarchism I encountered in the 90s and aughts when I was young uh, was very anti-programmatic, for example. And I was surprised how much understanding programs is important to understanding early anarchism. What are the kinds of things that have shifted or been abandoned um, from this, from this uh, period of anarchism uh, to today? And again, I realize this is a super broad question, so we can kind of do it like uh with some key examples we, of course we can't be exhausted because yeah i i think it really depends on the place right so like okay the cuban anarchism is still the same as classical anarchism during the cuban revolution um for example it's not like you know the new stuff there's the other examples in south america of, of, of anarchists who this is just the still doing classical anarchism but with a few additions and updating it um, but essentially what happens in the English speaking world is there's, it's very complicated, but you know, there's various factors that lead to it. So for example, in the U S anarchist movement, it gets repressed and it's mainly immigrants and they're either forced to, they either kicked out of the country and made to go, you know, deported like fascist Italy, for example, or they just get really old and their children become integrated into mainstream America and are no longer uh, immigrants in these radical communities. Um, and so there's this decline of the historical anarchist movement uh, in, in America. And when anarchism resurges in America, it develops out of things like conscientious objector camps in response to World War II. Uh, there's loads of influence from Quakers and like the peace movement. Um, and, and, they're essential, and they don't actually have that much knowledge of historical anarchism or access to historical anarchist sources, which are overwhelmingly not in English and have never been translated. And essentially, they kind of reinvent their own thing, which they're calling anarchism, and there's some things in common with it, but it's also distinct, and it's weirdly connected with, you know, the counterculture. And there are some people who are, you know, trying to keep the classic stuff alive. It's just there's all this other thing going on at the same time. Uh, or in the English speaking in England, there's a rise of anarchists who reject the very possibility of revolution just because atomic weapons exist. And this makes them go, well, this is no longer viable. Um, and, and it's in response to that that you get a group of UK anarchists who start calling themselves class struggle anarchists. Uh, they're actually just classical anarchism. <laughs> it hasn't changed, but they're having to rebrand themselves in response to this kind of these new kinds of anarchism that are emerging as part of the new left. Um, and I think now, and then it, it in turn is obviously then altered by, you know, the auto, auto globalization movement and then later Occupy. But I think what's been happening increasingly is that I feel like more modern anarchists are getting to grips with the history and with what historical anarchist ideas were. Um, I, I, especially as more stuff's being translated, you know, more books are coming out. There seems more familiarity with it than historically. Uh, so for example, you know, David Graeber is very explicit that he doesn't actually really know much about the history of anarchism or its ideas. Uh, yeah. He very explicitly says this. 
um, which is, you know, when you read him, oh, this actually makes a lot of sense because what he's saying is not really in many respects like a Stoic Granicus. Um, it turns out there's a reason why, which is that, you know, he wasn't super familiar with it. And that's not, that wasn't the key for where his anarchist politics, uh, how, how they like develop. Um, although pretty sure he did have like a relative relatives who were involved in uh, the Spanish revolution, but anyway. Um, and, and there's also, I think, been, I think there was a phrase, there were loads of people who we might call like anarcho-liberals. So they were mm -hmm. essentially like, they come into contact with anarchism through like Chomsky or Graeber, you know, and I like them both, despite having issues, um, you know, with many of the things they've said, um, but they essentially then don't go beyond that. And they, they, they're calling themselves anarchists, but they haven't really engaged with anarchist strategy right. and unlearned a lot of kind of liberal assumptions. Um, but that I, but that feels a lot less prominent than it used to be in like early, uh, like uh, my experiences online, for example. When I was in my my twenties, uh, what I would now uh, what Bosch Carson's car called anarcho liberalism, I would probably have called uh, Chomsky, Graeber, Naomi Klein thought. Um, so I I encountered it a lot both online and in the real world, but it and a lot of you know. Uh, talk about absolute banishing of hierarchies, a lot of talk about affinity groups, although what they meant by affinity groups was closer to what um, probably, you know, modern demo demograph demographicians or whatever uh, would mean by affinity groups and not what anarchists historically meant by it. And so, again, a lot of the mystification of words. And um, one of the things I've liked about anarchist research in the recent years and going back to this old uh, to this older stuff going through the arguments kind of systemically um uh i think you've inspired a couple of other people to start doing this um is that you can start seeing where these these ideas come from but also things like absolute consensus and and whatnot that wasn't how historical anarchist groups actually operated yeah that they, they 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 some use what's called unanimous decision making mm -hmm. but they don't have consensus and you know the various hand gestures and procedures and kind of st structured norms around consensus decision making they just think we will have to agree um but mass organizations use majority voting um federations use systems of majority voting um manatesta advocated unanimous agreement but when this isn't viable we do a majority vote. It's just that, you know, the, the decision of the majority isn't then like violently imposed on everyone, right? That's the key thing. So it's still within a voluntary association, but they still advocated uh, majority voting within a system of free association. And that was the main uh, anarchist position, as far as I can tell. Often they don't actually really go into specifics about how they actually make decisions. Uh, they just say, we will, and then they seem to, but they, it can be actually surprisingly hard to get specifics um, and but there are some definite examples where it's like yeah they're very explicit majority voting plus unanimous agreement and then various specifics about how to like organize that um, and the anti-organization has tended to be more pro unanimous um, which also makes sense because they're organizing you know just in the affinity groups and don't have to deal with the question of well how do we make a decision as a trade union with six hundred thousand members <laughs> um, yeah, that's not something they have to deal with. Um, this is a, I guess this is a good point to, to wrap it up. You mentioned that you're writing a book about the, the differences between, um, anarchism and Marx. And obviously we're going to have to wait for that book to be finished to, for, for the, <laughs> yeah, that, for that to be book. explored. Yeah. <laughs> I'm writing too many books at once. I'm making a mistake. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, as a, as a, as a public school teacher, a podcaster and, and, and now a book writer, I, I feel you. Um, it's just all of a sudden you realize like I'm doing 85 things a day. Um, but I was going to ask you like, um, in the, in the nineties and aughts, it felt like, uh, anarchism was the predominant form of leftism that you would encounter in the American radical sphere, uh, particular forms. I mean, it was like book Chen and then like Bob Black and hiking Bay and primitivist and, you know, uh, Stuff that's very removed from actually what we're talking about today, except for maybe Bookchin. I think Bookchin's kind of, kind of in this historical trajectory. But um, 
it, blah 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 cliche 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 uh 2007 return of marxism um and it, it kind of seems like that that kind of social democratic renewal moments uh over um it does seem like getting a grip on the differences between uh marx and anarchists it, it is kind of important now again uh, and it's going to be harder to do because um, not just because of the actual historical you know, difficulties, but also because there are multiple Marxist interpretive traditions that interpret the dispute with anarchists in different ways. So uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, are anarchists too violent, a la Lenin, or are they too soft, a la Engels? You know, um, yeah, what's, what's the specific problem? So... I guess the, the question that I'm really asking is why does it matter that we understand the distinction between Marxist and anarchist now, you know, um, almost 150 years after a lot of these debates happen? So I think first of all, is the fact that we're still having the same debates, uh, the same topics keep coming up, you know, should we engage in electoral politics or, or not? You know, how should we organize? How should we make decisions? What, what should the role of committed revolutionaries be in social movements? Um, so the same basic questions come up. Uh, second of all, a lot of Marxists argue through quoting scripture without understanding it. And Definitely. <laughs> with, <laughs> without, um, you know, and you get this thing where two Marxists quote the same Marx passage at each other and then interpret it differently based on their preconceived ideological you know, positions. Um, and they tend to just repeat whatever certain historic Marxists say about anarchism is true. You know, they'll just quote some Lenin thing about how anarchism's made no contributions to you know, socialist theory as fact, just because Lenin said it. And it's like, you know, so wrong that you don't even know where to begin kind of statements. And so given that, well, and how many people are getting into Marxism online, especially, you know, the rise of basically, you know, Stalinism that somehow kind of Stalinism removed from any context. Yeah, it, it's it's like first as tragedy, then as farce for, 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 for Marxist Leninism. It's kind of, uh, I view it as like some people get really into like being a K pop stan, other people are 20th century dictatorship stands or, you know, various kind of social movement stands that happened like long ago in the past and they build their sense of self around their stan culture. And they don't actually really do anything that they're, they're just, you know, they function similar to when, you know, like a Taylor Swift stan is arguing with a K-pop stan. It's like that, that's essentially their political activity, uh, but uh, about politics. And this leads to just widespread misinformation <laughs> spreading. Um, and, you know, I try and counteract that misinformation. So like I recently, you know, I saw a tweet claiming that Starbucks workers aren't proletarians. I wrote a two hour video essay on what the proletariat is because I was annoyed so much. Um, about, oh, yeah, yeah, know that what, you know, what the great mean. barista gate of yeah, the 2022 to 2024. Uh, our and, blue hairs aren't proletarians, but you know, these reason. kinds of things keep coming up as you get this like increasingly vulgar socialism that is even removed from you know, it's the aesthetics and terminology of Marxism or about mm. actually the actual ideas even of Marxist Leninism, it's, it's quite bizarre how it's like becoming this like caricature of itself. Um, because, you know, it turns out people pretend to read things or understand things that actually they haven't. Uh, imagine <laughs> <and> that. <laughs> imagine, imagine that happening. Um, and yeah, so I try to, you know, how can I make the world slightly less terrible is like, well, at least hopefully I can help some people get a firmer understanding of what the differences are what the positions are, so then we can have an honest, good faith discussion about what we personally think, as opposed to, you know, what did the historical people think? But because of how socialists argue, unfortunately, you know, it's often grounded in history, so you have to do the history to have those discussions. Yeah, I was, uh, I recently did a, a long uh, series of uh, deconstructions of um, Ingalls's on authority, which is a, I'm just going to say it, it's a bad text. Like it, it actually is not self-coherent. It, it, it hurts. Like in ways that Engels doesn't seem to to see, it actually hurts other Marxist theories. <laughs> like, 
So, you know, th this kind of uh, misinformation, unfortunately, goes all the way back to the beginning. But the people often citing, well, you know, Ingalls on authority settles the question. And I'm like, have you even read that text? Do you understand its argument? Can you can you break the arguments down? And, you know, yeah, I'm a Marxist, but I was just kind of aghast, like, like, break this text down. What is it actually arguing? There's there's shifting definitions in this text. There's uh, there's contradictory accusations. There's also like some kind of split between political and economic power that you don't you, you wouldn't think that uh, Marx and Engels would believe, you know, um, Cause so I, I, I once had a person tell me that I needed to read Engels's book on authority and I had to explain that it was not a book, <laughs> but they, they, they hadn't even read it and realized how short it was. It seemed maybe they have a very expansive notion of what a book is. Uh, something I used to do regularly was I would post tweets, which were just Marx and Engels quotes, but say, this is what anarchists think because it's something that anarchists do think is just, you know, not in their words. And then, you know, these people would be getting super mad, calling it childish and idealist and pretty bourgeois. And it's like, this is from Capital Volume 1, which you have never read. This is from Anti During, which you have never read. And But your entire personality is based on being so theory-pilled um, that you can't even immediately, you know, I, I had Engels' um, quote describing communism. I was told by, you know, self-proclaimed Marxist that this, this described a free market society because it used the phrase free and equal association of, of the producers. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, they, they didn't re realize that I was quoting it, one of the most famous Engels quotes of all time. Um, and these kinds of things that, yeah, it just makes me sad. And all I can do is try and go, well, so, some people do want to actually learn. And I know it's so much work to do the historical research because, you know, I, I do it. It's, it's a nightmare. So hopefully I can do loads of work and help people who are, you know, overworked and don't have the time or energy. I pack it all together in one big book. They can read it and you know, gain some understanding without having to like be a workaholic for 10 years, basically. Um, yeah, I, I do. I used to be, I used to be one of these people who, who would say like, don't go to the secondary sources, but increasingly I'm like, no, you have to historically contextualize this. And there's, I mean, like just with Marx alone, I mean, are you, you say you wanted to read the works of Marx, Engels and Lenin, you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of pages of, of work actually that are in some ways contradictory to themselves. Um, depending on when you're citing and, you know, uh, and so many Marxists have been invested in turning all this into like a singular coherent theory that's been like, you know, invariant and identical from, I guess, 1847 till today. And uh, yeah, you can't really have studied this regardless of whether or not you're a Marxist or an anarchist and believe that. And, and similarly with anarchism, I, I always hear Marxists make a lot of the frankly dumbest complaints against you know like college anarchists are that i'm like yeah but i'm like a lot of historical anarchists would probably agree with you about these ideas you can't blanket condemn this because somebody annoyed you because they picked up a crime think once or something like um i mean you know i, I pick on crime think a lot because they annoyed me in college um i also but, feel like yeah there's, <laughs> there's this double standard right where it's like if we're gonna judge marxism it's we're judging Marx. We're not judging like a random member of the Social Democratic Party who's memorized some Kowski, but doesn't right. actually really know that much. Right. You know, like that we don't form our opinions about Marxism from like that person. It's instead, no, we have to look at Marx and Engels and seriously study them. We're of anarchists. It's like, you know, you can, they, people just talk about it having never read Malatesta or, or, or actually read anything by Kropotkin apart from the conquest of bread. And therefore they don't understand anything in it because they don't know the context in which it was written uh, and what he says elsewhere at the same time, they totally misunderstand it because they don't have the context. Um, yeah, it's a disaster. So uh, thank you for the work you do, Zoe. Um, what would you like to plug? That's the weirdest thing about being in the socialist media space is we have to do the petty bourgeoisie with the air thing at the end. So I'm just going to do that right now and get it out of the way in our double yes. consciousness. So, yeah, <laughs> we're both workers and capitalists at the same time, as Mark says, borrowing Adam Smith. Um, so, yeah, I have my book, Means and Ends. You can get it from AK Press. Uh, if you don't have money, there is a free EPUB on the site LibGen. Uh, eventually, it's all going to be on the Anarchist Library uh, for free. Um, but I was going to wait till it had been out a while so AK Press could make some money and keep going because, you know, 
radical publishers operate on small amounts of money. Um, I have a YouTube channel, uh, Zoe Baker, uh, and I also post all my scripts onto my blog, like a narco pack, so that if you dislike my voice or prefer to read, it's there on my blog, along with all my page references, crucially. I always have citations. I'm a maniac for citation. Um, lastly, you know, I have Instagram. I used to be on Twitter regularly, but then I stopped because it prevents me from working. Uh, so it's like, I can either be on Twitter or I can work. I can't do both. So I'm not on Twitter. Yeah, um, I was off Twitter for, for six months, uh, no, 10 months. And I came back in the last couple of weeks to book guest, And I almost immediately regret it. Cause I'm already like, oh, I've done like 600 tweets in three weeks. Shit. I need to stop. Um, and also, I think Twitter is a bad... It, you can get a really malformed view of radicalism from Twitter. Um, yeah, I, if Twitter was radicalism, I would be unbelievably depressed. Right. <laughs> you know, I, uh, tw Twitter's not a nice place. Um, and it actively incentivizes the most brutish, terrible aspects of human beings in order to gain gratification in the form of a number going up. Um, and, and just to increase, you know, engagement so that there's more time on device, so there's more advertising. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, it, I, all social media is pernicious like that after they figured out how to monetize it, but Twitter's particularly bad. It does seem like Twitter actually encourages, you know, how can I make people the angriest and what's the most lunatic thing I can say so more people hate follow me? Like, it's a, it's a bizarre set of incentives. Um Thank you so much for coming on, and we're going to end this here. Have a great rest of your day.